dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus, the one who is the Messiah and the Christ. Amen. Well, one day a man told his friend that he had become a Sunday school teacher at his local church. And his friend said, you, a Sunday school teacher? I bet you don't even know the Lord's Prayer. He said, yes, I do. Of course I do. Everybody knows the Lord's Prayer. It goes like this. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And his friend was astonished, and he said, you win. I didn't know you knew so much about the Bible. Prayer. At Gloria Day, we're, uh, as I said, going through the Gospel of Luke, and we've reached chapter 11, and uh, in chapter 11, the disciples approach Jesus, and they ask him about prayer. It seems that John the Baptist, John was teaching some of his disciples about prayer, and so Jesus' disciples said, Lord, we want you to teach us to pray. So let me begin by asking you today. How's your prayer life? How's your prayer life for you in your life? Maybe for you it's going very, very well and it's something that you do on a very regular basis. But maybe some of you today are thinking, you know, Pastor Tim, I know that I should. I know that my prayer life should be a little bit better than it is. And you know, I've tried. I've tried this prayer thing and it just isn't working very well. If that's you, then take comfort, I think, at least, because I think there's a lot of Christians like that. If we were to take a poll, probably even of active Christians, uh, they may say their prayer life is anywhere from average to non-existent. But why is that? Why is it sometimes that we have difficulty praying and with our prayer life, even though the Bible is filled with great exhortations and teachings about prayer? For example, 1 Peter 4, 7 says, Be serious in your discipline about prayer. Colossians 4, 2, the Apostle Paul says, Devote yourselves always in prayer, keeping alert with it in thanksgiving. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, a verse worth your memorizing, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, where Paul urges us to pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Even with these great verses, I think it's quite common, as I said, for even Christians to not have the prayer life, the enriching prayer life that God wants for us. God knows that it is important and good for us to be in constant prayer, Pray without ceasing in constant communication with him. But why is it that sometimes we have difficulty with prayer? Probably many reasons, but I want to list just two for you this morning as I get going. One is I think that maybe sometimes we're just not quite sure what to say. I want to be clear, I'm not talking about having to get up in front of the church or even having to pray in public, even if it's in your Bible study. I know there's a lot of people that have told me over the years, they said, you know, we don't come to a small group or a Bible study because we're kind of afraid they might ask us to pray out loud. It's difficult sometimes and nerve-wracking to get up in public and to pray. So I'm not talking about that. That's hard for many people to do. I think of that movie, uh, Meet the Parents. I don't know if any of you ever saw Meet the Parents, but in that movie, Ben Stiller's character, Greg, is uh, meeting his future in-laws for the very first time, and he's very nervous when he goes over to their house, and the father figure in that movie is at the dinner table, and of course he asks his future son-in-law, the first time he ever met him, to pray out loud, and it's nerve-wracking for Ben Stiller's character. Take a look. Well, sometimes it's, it's difficult to pray out loud in public, but what God's talking about, what God wants to teach us is that our prayer life in its simplest and in most profound form is simply communicating with God, simply talking with God, uh, whatever it is that you're doing, taking five minutes, taking ten minutes a day, being still, sitting with God, sharing him, with him whatever is on your heart and on your mind. It's personal. It's personal prayer, communicating with God, just you and God much of the time. You see, God loves it when we talk to him, and God knows that it's very good for us 
to be in communication with the one who created us. My wife and I are empty nesters for the first time this year, and uh, we love it when our kids call. They're out of the house now, and we just love it when our kids call us. It makes our day. Well, half the time when they call me, they're asking for money, but I love it the other half of the time when they call and they talk. And that's how God feels too, right? That's how God feels. He says, I want you to be in communication with me on a very regular basis. Pray without ceasing. Whatever's going on in your life, And in your personal prayers, if you even don't know what to say in your personal time or your personal prayers with God, God makes some amazing promises to us about prayer. If we don't know what to say, he says, then just sit with me. Sit with me in silence. Let your emotions, let your feelings, let your concerns, let the stuff of your heart just kind of rise up to me. You don't even need to Put it into words if you don't want to. Romans 8.26 says this. It says, Likewise, the Holy Spirit helps us in our prayers, for we don't always know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit, Romans says, intercedes for us as believers according to the will of God. That is an amazing promise that the Holy Spirit is praying for us. What a great reality that is. So if you're feeling joyful, or if you're feeling hurt, or you're in need of God's presence, and all you can do is sigh, all you can do is groan, God knows what you're feeling, and the Holy Spirit takes that and he articulates it up to the throne of God, up to God. God says, talk to me. Talk to me like a friend because I am your friend. Talk to me like a person, a friend of yours who knows you better than anyone else because God says, I do know you better than anybody else. I made you. I love you. I know everything about you. So talk to me. Bring me your joys. Bring me your concerns. I even know the number of hairs on your head. He says 42,574 right over there. 24,682 right over there. Seven back there. He knows the details of our lives better than even we know them ourselves. He says, talk to me that way. So bring your prayers to God. Even if you don't know what to say, spend time in prayer with the one who loves you and created you. And then secondly, I think a second reason sometimes we have a hard time praying, and I know this is one trap that I sometimes fall into, is that we think, well, we don't want to bother God. We don't want to bother God with our kind of little stuff or what we think may be small things. You know, God has so many big things on his mind. Why should he be concerned about me? Why should he be concerned about my stuff? God's dealing with things like world peace and violence in Syria. I'm not going to bother God with my little anxieties and my little worries. Why should I do that? He's got other people to worry about. If that's you sometimes, then listen to this. God is there for you every second of every day. God can handle what's going on in Syria at the same time as he's listening to me, for example, and my stuff, telling him my dreams for my kids or asking for guidance with this, this issue or that concern. God is not bound. We need to know this. God is not bound by time and space. God invented it. So God can be in all places at all times. He can be concerned for you just as he is for the rest of the world. He's never ever going to say to you, you're a bother to me. He's never going to say, oh, come on. I can't believe you brought that petty little concern to me. I'm dealing with world hunger and you're telling me about a a toenail problem with your pet dog? Please, don't bring that to me. You're bothering me. God says, no, nothing in your life that's going on is a bother to me. Bring it to me all the time. You and I have God's undivided attention 24-7, 365 days a year for the rest of our lives. That is a tremendous, tremendous gift that God gives us. You have, God says, my full-blown attention just as if you were the only one on this earth. You are not disturbing you. 
disturbing me, you will never, ever disturb me. So God wants to hear from you about everything about everything. Talk to him like you talk to your friends over and over and over again. The parables, the stories that Jesus tells in the text we read today are all about being persistent in our prayers, almost to the point of bothering God, sharing with God so many times, but he's not bothered. It's just a, an example of saying, you need to share with me over and over what's on your heart and what's on your mind. It's good for you, God says, and I will bless you through it. And so the disciples say to Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. And Jesus responds with that great prayer, that prayer that we call the Lord's Prayer. And it would be fun sometime to take a preaching series and to get into every single petition or every single phrase of the Lord's Prayer. We don't have time for that this morning. But what I want to do just uh, this morning is to take a look at that first petition. The first petition that, that uh, is part of that Lord's Prayer. Right off the bat, Jesus tells the disciples, and he blows their mind by telling them this. This is a radical new teaching for them. He says, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven. And they're saying, what? You mean we can address God like Father? We thought that uh, God was distant. We thought that God stayed us separate from our lives. We thought that this omnipresent, omniscient, all-powerful God was one who stayed up in heaven and sat on his throne and judged us. And Jesus says, no, it's different. God wants to come close to you. God wants you to address him as a father, better translated as a dad or as a papa or however you say that, an endearing term for, for God. He says, that's how you can address God, because he loves you that much. He wants to be your friend in that way. He was thought to be just one who created the world and stayed distant, and Jesus said, no, God loves you, and he comes close to you in me, the Word made flesh. So God as Father, as kind, loving Father, is a good image. And maybe some of you today are saying, you know, my earthly father wasn't that great. I didn't have a very good relationship with my father, or I don't have a good relationship with him. You're blessed if you do, but maybe you're distant from yours, or maybe, worse yet, yours was very rude or mean or even abusive to you as you were growing up, and you're saying, you know, this image of father for God isn't very helpful for me. It's kind of even keeping me at a little distance from God. If that's you, you're right. We fail miserably sometimes as our role as fathers. But let me just say this. Let me say as clearly as I can today that God is not that father. God is not that kind of father. God is the father who shows up. God is the father who is there for you. God is the father who cares for you. God is the father who has you in his loving embrace. God is the father that you deserve. Our father who art in heaven, Jesus says. That's the kind, loving, caring, compassionate Father who meets you and me in our joys, but also meets us in our hurts and our heartaches. God the Father who says, as our choir sang so beautifully this morning, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm there for you. You're with me, God. This God is with us in all circumstances, every step of the way, shepherding us. We do a lot of weddings here at Gloria Day, and as a pastor, I'm not sure how many weddings I've presided over over the years, but it certainly has been in the hundreds. As pastors, Heidi and Lauren and I get to stand up front, and we get a bird's eye view. We get a great view of everything that's going on in the wedding. We get to see the, the uh, ring bearers, the flower girls, the moms being seated, the grandparents, everything. But one of my favorite things about a wedding is watching in the back right here. When they turn the corner, the bride coming down the center aisle, and she's there most of the time with her father. The father walking his daughter down the aisle. Sometimes it's a mom or sometimes it's somebody else significant in her life, but much of the time it's a father. And you can see the emotion. You can see the joy. You can see the, the tears and you can see the smiles, just the, the ultimate joy going on. I just love that. 
reminding me a little bit of another wedding that was very important to me. It was my own wedding when I was a groom. I was up front with my best man, Dan, when my brother was my best man, and I was up front with him. And I wasn't nervous at all uh, getting ready for the wedding. I wasn't nervous until right before the wedding. I got really nervous, and, and uh, it hit me when uh, I saw my wife kind of coming around the corner with her father, arm in arm. And I literally started to shake. I was shaking, and my best man, Dan, is like going, Dude, what's going on? What are you so nervous about? And it hit me. She was beautiful. You know how that is, guys. When you get married, you see your bride, and it's, she's just beautiful. But then I panic, and I think, Wow, she's so beautiful. She's out of my league. She's like two or three leagues ahead. She's like, oh boy, did I marry up? And then I, my eyes caught hers and I panicked and I thought, man, maybe she's thinking the same thing. Like, I'm way out of his league. What in the world am I doing? And I started to panic. But what calmed me down was seeing her father. Seeing her father there with her. And then I turned to my right and I saw my dad. He was officiating. He was officiating pastor at our wedding. And I began to calm down to say, you know what? Our fathers are here. Our mothers are here. Our families are here. This is a family thing. There's no need to be nervous. There's no need to be afraid. That's the kind of father that God is. He says, I am like that calming, loving parent who wants you to bring everything going on in your life to me. That's the kind of parent and father that God is. Jesus saves you by his work on the cross. He saves you by his work on the cross. You can believe that. You can trust it. And now God says, as a child of mine, I want to have this close, intimate relationship with you. So come to me with whatever's going on in your life. So let me encourage you today during Lent, and then make it a habit if you haven't yet in your life. Set aside times. It doesn't need to be long. Start with two minutes, three minutes, whatever it might be, a day. And just kind of sit in silence. Share with God as you would share with a best friend what's going on. Don't worry even about the words because the Holy Spirit will take, as I said, those words and bring them up to God. God is approachable and he loves you. And then be open to seeing some surprising ways in which God speaks to you, in which God answers your prayer. As we always do, uh, prior to communion, we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer. But we're going to pray it now, too, by hearing it sung. And as you listen to this Lord's Prayer being sung, I want you to just kind of soak it in, breathe it in, think about the words, think about the petitions, think about our Father, the one who loves us, our dad who loves us, and all of the things that go together in this beautiful, magnificent, greatest prayer ever given us. Focus on each phrase. This is Jesus' prayer, remember, given to you and to me as a gift. So as the music plays and the song is sung, simply lift up your hearts to God.